So, we are in the book of Ruth. We had this started this series called Reclaimed. And also, I just want to say, you guys remember the story I mentioned yet last week about the guy who came with me who said I'm coming with? That was Sergio. Where'd he go? He's gone. He's coming with and he left again. No. But Sergio was leading worship today, so I'm, I'm super glad to see him leading worship. Yeah. And he's been with me since the beginning. The beginning. And so it's so important to, uh, man, I'm just so grateful to see him up here today. Um, never left my side, which is really cool. So we're in the second week of this series called Reclaimed, and, and they, also, they also sang the song that I wrote, so that was pretty cool. And it was great to see you guys uh, uh, joining in on that too. Um, and we're looking into the book of Ruth, right? Uh, and we're, we're seeing that we're, we're all created in God's image with purpose, with value, and with dignity. Um, no matter how far down you are from the Lord uh, or your lives can be or how far you feel from God, uh, our stories matter to God and to others. And last week I talked about your story and how it mattered. And I asked you to think about your story. Some people, they downplay their story. They think it's not important. Oh, I grew up in a good family, nothing really surprising. I wasn't a bad kid. And they think that story doesn't count. They dismiss it. They minimize it. Others have a really long sh uh, list of, uh, of stuff that they've done and, uh, you know, and, and they walk around with shame. And they don't want to talk about it because it just brings up ill feelings. So they think their story's not good enough. But what if I said your story matters? And we look, we're looking into Ruth's narrative and it's a beautiful story. Um, but it started with great pain and with great loss. It started with uh, bad choices that led to brokenness. And at the end of the message, I called everyone. The message was, return. Do you remember that? I said, return. Return to God. What do you have to return to? And I have a bunch of sticky notes here that said, that proves that you guys ha uh, felt in your heart and your mind that there was something that you needed to return from. Like anger, resistance, anxiety, fear, not worthy of love, alcohol, alcoholism. These are the things that we had to turn from. But now what? Okay, I came to the altar, I wrote it on a sticky note, now what? Now what do I do, Pastor Eric? Um, you know, returning is... Is hard, but you know what's even harder? Staying. Staying. So if you're asking me this morning, okay, Pastor Eric, I did it. I returned. I went to the altar. I, I returned from, from alcoholism and anger and unforgiveness and all of those things. I know God's stirring it up in my heart. Now what? Because it's hard. It was, it was hard on Sunday, but man, it's even harder on Monday. It's harder when I don't have a church family around me and it's just me at work. Or it's just me crying my eyes out because nothing's changing yet. And it would be easy to say, you know what, forget this, I'm going back. At least over here I, I masked it and I covered it and, and it looked different and no one really messed with it. I just left it alone and I, I kind of had a good day. But my message to you today is to stay here. Simply stay. Come, return to the Lord, and stay in His presence. So the question this morning, last week I asked you, as I'm talking, I want you to think through this question. What do I need to return from? What do I need to return from? So the question today, if you have a, a, a bulletin, you're taking notes, write this. How do I stay? How do I stay? How do I stay when everything is not changed? I prayed this prayer. I wrote the sticky note. I gave it to the Lord, gave it to God, right? We say that. We don't even know what that means sometimes, but we said it. I gave it to God. I left it at the altar. But somehow it jumped in the backseat driving home, and it's with me again at home. And it's not your kids, okay? Now what? How do I continue this at home, at my job, 
with my spouse, with, with my children, in my relationships, at school, whatever it may be. And so if you're taking notes this morning, the big idea we're going to be talking about is this. God is working in your story for his glory and your good. God is working in your story for his glory and your good. That's the big truth that we're going to talk about today as we open up um, the book of Ruth, chapter 2. If you've got a, one of the Bibles in front of you, um, it's, it's page 2, 221. And so we ended uh, last week the story of Naomi and Ruth, right? And uh, Naomi and Ruth lost everything. Naomi, Naomi specifically. She was married with two sons, uh, her husband, um, and her left Bethlehem because they didn't trust that God would provide. And so they went to a place where they thought they could make it happen. And what ended up happening? Uh, Naomi's husband dies. And she's like, okay, well, I still got my sons. Well, guess what? Then they died. And so now it's just this widow, Naomi, who's getting older in years, and then she's got her two daughter-in-laws. What are we going to do? So she sends, she goes, you know what, I'm going to go back to my hometown, where my family is at. I'm going to go back. You should go back too. So she kind of shoes off the daughter-in-laws um, to maybe go and find another husband. That way they could uh, uh, at least live a good, decent life. And Orpah decides to go after the third time of Naomi shooing her. And uh, Ruth decides, no, nah, no way. She cl- it says that she clung to Naomi, right? And so they made the trek. They made the trek back to Bethlehem. And, uh, and they, they came back, but they didn't see that God was setting them up for great blessing. In fact, they came almost beaten, beaten down. Uh, Naomi couldn't see past her pain. She couldn't see past her story. She was blaming God for her situation to the point where she even changed her name. Her name was Naomi, which meant pleasant. And she said, no, call me Mara, which means bitter. Because God has done this to me. The Almighty has done this to me. She was blaming God. So did they return? Yes, they returned. But they weren't happy about it. They weren't happy about it at all. I mean, they were feeling hopeless, lonely, defeated, maybe even abandoned. How is returning going to help my situation? How, how, is a, how is that going to fix my problem of family, of food, and shelter? How is this supposed to correct the brokenness that I'm experiencing? How is coming back going to fix all that? So the question is, how do I stay? How do I stay? Why should I stay? How is this going to work? You ever been there where, like, you think you're doing the right thing and you don't see how this is going to work out? And man, and sometimes when you feel defeated and you feel broken and you feel like your experience is hopeless, what am I doing? What are we doing here? How do I stay here? So there's a couple things that I gather from Ruth's story. We're, we're in chapter 2, and this is an amazing story. I love it. I'm not good, I'm not a really, I'm not into like sappy, you know, chick flick movies. And this is totally a sappy chick flick movie, you know. But it it is pretty amazing. So how do I stay? The first one is this. If you're writing notes, write this down. Stay humble, not upset. Stay humble, not upset. Ruth chapter 2. So Naomi and and, uh, Ruth come back, and now chapter 2. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was, who was of the clan of Elimelech. So stay humble, not upset. So what's happening is, um, I, I love how the writer begins this chapter, and it's a total spoiler alert, you know? It's a total spoiler alert. Like, hey, there was this man named Boaz who happened to be in the same clan, and he was a, he was a mighty man. 
and then just leave that there and then go into the rest of the narrative. It's, it's kind of like, who's seen Endgame yet? Okay, all right, so for the whole week that I, I wanted to watch Endgame, I had to like avoid everybody, right? No social media, don't talk to me, I don't want to hear it because you're going to spoil it, right? That's how it kind of feels when I'm reading this because we, he, he introduces Boaz, but we don't know who Boaz is. How does he fall into this story? We just talk him up. It's like, oh, okay, well, I wonder what he's about, right? Um, and, and it seems like Naomi's position wasn't as, as bleak as she had said it to be. God took everything from me. You know, my husband died, my sons died, now what's going to happen? I have no family. Uh, you know, she, she made it sound like it was completely hopeless. And then in chapter 2, hey, there's this relative that she has who's rich, right? He's a good man. He's a mighty warrior. He's from the same clan. He loves the Lord. Like, really? Okay. And he's, he's, not, just, uh, he's not just any man. And I, and I think about that. I think the writer's trying to tell us something. It's setting us up for something that Naomi and Ruth don't know. They don't know this yet. In fact, the only thing I can think about of why Naomi isn't thinking on this is because she's so stuck in her mind, in her circumstances, that she doesn't even realize you have a lot more than you think you do. You ever been there? Because Boaz wasn't just any guy. He was of the same clan. The same clan. So families were in clans. Clans ended up being in the same tribe. So they were in the same tribe and the same clan. He was a very close relative. And it gave him the name, uh, uh, he was a mighty man. This is the same language that was used of Gideon as being a mighty warrior. This is the same verbiage that's being used for Boaz. So he's not just a regular guy. He's the guy from the right family, and he's a strong man. He's a good leader. He's a good man. Another uh, version of Scripture uh, says that he, he was a man of standing. And so the, the crazy thing about this that I want to uh, let us know, uh, Naomi wasn't thinking on this level at the moment, but because Boaz was who he was and he was of the same clan, he was eligible to be what's called a kinsman redeemer. This was written in Jewish law. So he was eligible to be a kinsman redeemer to Naomi. And that would change everything. What's a kinsman redeemer? Well, that's a great question. Thank you, Julio. Appreciate that. So a kinsman redeemer was this. Let's say there was, a, um, there was uh, two brothers and um, the one was married and the one brother died. The brother-in-law then could take his brother's wife as his own in order to produce an heir and redeem all of the land and inheritance that might have been sold off. He could redeem it if he was a close relative. Later in life, they actually extended it from just being a, a, like a brother-in-law or a, or a cousin to like even third cousins and stuff like that. So Boaz wasn't the brother-in-law. He wasn't that close like a brother um, but he was close enough in, 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 uh, in the family line that he could step into this role. He could take and redeem Naomi's life. She wouldn't be a widow, right? He could, he could do this. So it's really powerful how it sets up. Hey, there, by the way, there was this guy who could save everything. Oh, okay, let's keep going to the story. That's, how, that's when I read that. When I read that, I was like, oh, well, Naomi didn't mention that. She kind of left that part out. It was more like, woe is me. My life stinks, right? And uh, so Boaz, um, as a relative from the same clan as Elimelech, um, but it says that he was a worthy man, right? We talked about that. So the writer is letting us know this information, but this isn't even on Naomi's level yet. She's still stuck in her mess. She doesn't even, she doesn't remember that she has this family that could do this. If she did, she didn't mention it. So you just kind of wonder what, what's happening in her mind, or it kind of gives you a little glimpse of the state of her mind. You ever been stuck in your mess that you don't see nothing else? When all you can focus on is your hardships? But Ruth was on another level here. You see, when she said, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God, and I'm coming with you, and when you die, I'm going to die right next to you, she meant it. She wasn't Jewish. She was a Moabite woman. 
the writer clearly tells us this over and over. Every time it talks about her, Ruth, the Moabite woman, you know, it's, it's kind of like saying, hey, you know, so-and-so, the illegal. That's how we would say it today. And countless time, Ruth, this lady that doesn't belong here, she did this. And what does she do? She got to work. She decides to go to work and decides to start working on the problem of food for the day. But it's not like she was putting out resumes for an equal opportunity job. You know what I'm saying? She wasn't getting on her, her, her pantsuit and going for interviews trying to make, you know, above minimum wage. No, she didn't have that. In fact, she knew that she was a Moabite woman. She knew she was a foreigner. She knew she was less than everybody. There was no comparison. She didn't belong. But it didn't stop her. That's what I love about her. See, we see a humbleness in Ruth that we can't ignore. There is a genuine humbleness, humility. She says, let me go and see who I can find favor with that would let me glean, pick up scraps, the leftovers of those that were reaping the harvest. She's saying, let me go and pick up the extra and see if somebody will let me even do that. She's in a very humble position. And even her her attitude is humble as, as that. But you see, this is how providential God is and was. Um, God had set in place long before that in the Jewish law that um, every time there was a harvest, the landowners would re, uh, leave the corners of the harvesting fields for the needy and for the poor, for those who were less than, the, out, the outcasts of society. And so that's what happens. So Ruth is saying, let me go see who I can find favor with. Let me go see if somebody, a landowner, would let a Moabite woman go and glean in the corners and pick up the leftovers. So do you see how far down she has put herself? But she goes to work. She stays humble. She's not upset. Naomi's over here having a, a hissy fit, right? And Ruth says... I'm going to go get food. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. I think that's powerful as we look at Ruth's position and her attitude. So, so Ruth is going out and she's looking for someone that would allow her to glean. This is a big if. A big if. In fact, this is the time when there was no king. So we're in a time of judges. Which means that it wasn't like a king with, with, a, with an army who would enforce the laws. People were under divine ruling. But how many know people aren't perfect? And without getting, you know, our mind in the gutter, you could imagine what was happening to the poor in the corners of these fields. I wonder how many of these landowners who... Um, maybe weren't worshiping God the way they should, says, well, yeah, I'll let you glean if you do something for me. The, this was a real thing. We're going to read about that in just a moment. See, she's not from around here, so the odds are stacked against her. There is nothing in Ruth's favor, but she says, let me go see who I can find favor with. Let me go and find favor. Let me go find work. See, we need to stay humble, not upset. She wasn't angry about her position. Did it stink? Absolutely. Absolutely. But she chose something different. And sometimes I think it's hard. I think, it, I think of when hard times hit us, right? When we get punched in the gut, right? When, when, when the circumstances of life come like a wave and topple over us, we get humbled real quick, right? But does it last? Does it last? Sometimes it doesn't. It's not long sometimes. Sometimes we're more interested in, okay, okay, God, all right. Is this going to be over already? Like, okay, I learned my lesson. Yeah, I get it. I get it. And the, and the circumstances don't change, and then we get upset like, God, for real. I'm done. Can we move on? And we, we don't stay humble. It's like we forgot the humble position we put ourselves in with our gambling or our addiction. 
It's like we forgot that we made bad decisions that got us to this point, and we want to be angry at God because he's not coming like a government buyout and, 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 and helping us out. And then we want to get upset. See, Ruth, Ruth stayed humble. She didn't get upset. So how do we stay? Stay humble, not upset. That doesn't mean you have to like your situation. But sometimes when, when, when life is hard and, and we're, we're coming, we return, and we're wondering, man, this is not working out the way that I wanted it to. It's not moving fast enough. The temptation would be to go back. Stay. We need to stay humble, not upset. God is working in your story for his own glory and your good. Remember that. The second thing I see from Ruth's story is this. Stay active, not passive. Stay active, not passive. We'll continue in, in the Ruth 2. And it says, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to, this, to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, like a foreman, and he says, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now except for a short rest. So Ruth gets to work, right? And it just so happens that she ends up, right, in the field that belongs to Boaz. Uh, what a coincidence. You know, the problem is I don't believe in coincidences, right? I believe in the providence of God. The Almighty who is working all this out for, the glory, for his glory and the good of Ruth and Naomi, even though they don't see it yet. They don't see it. She not only stayed humble, but she stayed active. I love that Ruth went to work. I love that. And it says that Bo Boaz was a mighty man. And as he approaches the scene, uh, the first words that he says, in his, besides when the writer introduced him of who he was, but the first words that Boaz says, really important. It says a lot about a man, right? Kind of like a, a first impression. First impressions mean a lot, right? Here's the first impression of Boaz. He says, and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. These are his workers. He's a business owner. Think about this. Anybody who is a manager or a business owner in the room. He went to his people and said, the Lord be with you. And they answered, and the Lord bless you. This, this tells us the kind of man that Boaz was. He wasn't just a man from Bethlehem of the same clan of Elimelech, of the same bloodline. A, a, a noble man who had, who had standing, he had money, he had land, but also he was a man that feared God. He was a man that feared God. And he has good relationships with his, with his workers. He's a mighty man from Bethlehem, a man of standing, of the same clan of Naomi. And so I'm just saying, any single ladies out here, you know, um, good man, has a job, loves Jesus. Right? That's, that's what you should be going for. Okay? Nothing less. Don't settle. Right? Hear what I'm saying because I'm not lying. Don't settle. Good man has a job, loves Jesus. Right? If, he, if he's a good man and doesn't have a job but loves Jesus, he's not for you. Okay? He has to have all three. All right? Can I get an amen? amen. All right, good. <laughs> that's, a little, that's a freebie. But Boaz, he, he notices Ruth. He notices this, this woman that's in his fields that's not one of his. And he goes, whose woman is that? Right? I can almost see, like, you know, uh, biblical pickup lines. I don't know. Maybe this might have been one. I don't know. <laughs> and he didn't say, who is that? He said, whose is that? Whose is that? Who is this woman? This great man of stature notices the lowly Moabite woman. Right, right about now, this is where what I was talking about, like that sappy chick flick, you know what I'm saying? Because it's getting to that point, right? 
You know, and if you're married, you know, sometimes your wife will make you watch a movie you don't want to watch, right? And it's about this time of the movie where I'm like, come on, are you serious? This doesn't happen. And then you look over and she's either like so happy or just crying because she's so happy, right? And you're just whatever, right? I can't deal with this. Well, it seems like this kind of stuff actually happens in the Bible here, right here, right here in this story. But what was it that caught the attention of Boaz? Was it that she was all dialed up? Handing out resumes? Nope. Was she speaking to an audience so that he could see how how intellectual she was? Nope. What was she doing? She was gleaning. She was active. She was noticed working hard in a humble determination to find favor to glean. She went to work. And some of us, we're trying to to stay by not moving. Let me tell you something. Staying is not the same thing as being lazy. Staying doesn't mean not moving, not doing something. So when I say stay here, I don't mean motionless, mindless, It takes hard work to stay. I'm not diminishing the the decision to return. That was a hard choice. But life is full of hard choices. And it's, I would even say for some, it's harder to stay than it was to initially return. It's hard to stay in this right relationship with God. Why? Because we're messed up, broken people who get it wrong every day. So if you're feeling that, good. You're in the right place. Because we're all broken. Ruth was not lazy. In her humble position, she was determined to find favor. She was determined to find favor, and she went to work. So see, someone, someone needs to hear this today. Sometimes, sometimes when you're in that season, when you're in the season of despair, when you're in the season of it's, it, it feels like it's uphill, hard labor work, and you don't know what to do, your health, your relationships, your job, everything seems to be crumbling through your fingers. What do you do? Good man told me one time, he says, Eric, when you don't know what to do, do the next thing. When you don't know what to do, do the next thing. What's the next thing? Well, I got to get up today. Sometimes just getting up and going to work is what you got to do. Sometimes getting up and going and and loving on your spouse and, and, and being there for your kids or going to the game or going grocery shopping or going to the laundromat, whatever it is that you have to do, whatever's next on the thing for you to do that day, sometimes when you don't know what to do, just do the next thing. Put one step, one foot in front of the other. And that's what, uh, that's what Ruth was doing. Returning is hard, I get it, I get it. Coming back to God and his plan for your life can seem so daunting sometimes. But you know what's hard sometimes is staying in the place that God wants you to stay and working hard at it. So some of you are thinking of leaving your marriage. Just put that out there. You're wrestling with that idea, stay. Stay and work hard. Some of you are battling the hardships of parenting. And you're ready to give up and be passive. Stay and work hard. Some of you are battling, uh, thinking about quitting a job. Stay and work hard. Stay. The message isn't run. The message isn't quit. The message is if it gets too hard, then it's okay to give up. That's not the message this morning. The message is stay here. Stay. And why would I tell you to stay and work hard when it seems like nothing's working out, when it seems like this is overwhelming and no good is coming from this? I'm not getting the results that I'm looking for. I'm trying to stay humble, but I'm really getting upset inside. Why would I tell you to do this? 
when all you want to do is run. Because God, God is working in your story for his glory and your good. That's why. But you know what? You won't see that if you give up. You're not going to experience that if you give up. Quitters get nothing. That's how it goes, right? Unless you live in the suburbs and everybody gets a participation award. But not with Jesus, okay? So stay humble. And stay active in your situation. Ruth went to work and she worked hard. And what sparked interest in Boaz was that uh, this is what sparked interest in Boaz, that he would ask about her. Who's this woman working here? Who does she belong to? I, I have not seen her. The last thing this morning, and I want to kind of get through this quickly here. How do we stay? Stay humble, not upset. Stay active, not passive. And lastly, stay grateful, not entitled. Stay grateful, not entitled. Pick up in, in the story here. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping. Go after them. Have I not charged uh, the young men not to touch you? That's, you could read into that a little bit, right? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and your mother and your native land and you came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given, uh, given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord. For you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. See, Boaz not only noticed this Moabite woman, but he gathered intel on her, right? Who's that? Tell me about her. Tell me about this girl. Who is she? What's she like? What's her favorite color? Right? And now this great man of standing and stature asking about this lowly Moabite woman, he is approaching her. Now, if you're a Jewish reader, right? Remember, this, this was written to the Jews and Gentiles in, in, in a different era. So when they're reading this story, I want you to picture it through their mind. He did what? What's he doing? We don't do that. How dare he? He approaches this Moabite woman. And he begins to show her favor that she didn't merit. He tells her, stay here. Stay here. Don't go to another field. Glean here. Follow my women. Follow behind them. And I told all the guys already, you are protected by the name of Boaz. None of these guys are going to catch you in the field. They're not going to do anything to you. You're safe. Can you, can you understand what... Ruth is experiencing here right now? Where they go, you go. And if you're thirsty, oh, by the way, if you're thirsty, I want you to go and drink from, from, the, from the vessels that the men drawn. See, this was different because to a Jewish reader, like, what? No, 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 no. The women go and get the water, and the men drink from what the women drew. That's the day we lived in here. And he's saying, no, no, no. You go drink from what they drew. Because I said so. This is unheard of. In these days there was no king, so anything could have happened to Ruth in another field. 
And why would the writer say, haven't I told them not to touch you unless there was an issue of these guys touching women in the fields? So I want you to get a picture of what Ruth humbly and actively was doing because of her commitment to Naomi. It wasn't just reaping or harvesting. She was putting herself in harm's way. She was a foreign woman who didn't know the land and didn't know the people and somebody else's property where bad stuff happened. But Boaz is saying, no, you're protected. You're protected. Don't worry about those guys. They know not to touch you. And you know what? Don't worry about the corners anymore. You don't have to worry about the corners. Follow my girls. Follow those who work for me and glean after them. So now she's got the whole field. You're provided for. You're provided for. You're protected. And if you're thirsty, don't worry. I got you. Drink from what my people drink from. She's taken care of. That's what Boaz is telling her. He is lavishing favor on her, and she knows it. She's feeling it. Her knees are buckling, and she bows down and says, Why? Why have you noticed me? How have I found favor in your eyes? Still humble. Still actively working. It says that she was there since the morning, and and she only took one small break, and it was now evening. And see, it was pretty crazy because even back then, those who were reapers, that was their job. They reaped. They didn't beat out the grain. So the men had jobs. The women had jobs all in this field. There was like a team, right? You had divisions. This team did this. This team did that. And this team did this. Naomi, uh, Ruth was one person. She did it all in one day. She got up early. She worked her butt off. She reaped. She gleaned. Then she went, and while everyone else is having dinner, we'll read later uh, next week when she was beating out the, the, the wheat herself. She's working hard. And she's been working hard in this humble posture, doing what she has to do to take care of her mother-in-law, and she isn't expecting any special treatment. In fact, she knows she's not going to get it. Why? Because she's the Moabite woman. She's not from here. She doesn't have rights here. She's not our people. She doesn't deserve it. And she can't earn it. But Boaz does. Boaz sees her. He noticed her. He noticed how hard she was working. See, she stayed grateful, not entitled. She didn't say, well, it's about time someone noticed all the stuff I've been doing around here. It's about time I get some respect. Unfortunately, we live in a day that, that not just for women, but for men, where we have to assert ourselves to prove ourselves. But Ruth shows us a different picture. See, this is a picture of that if you humble yourself, God will lift you up. Not if you lift yourself up, God will meet you there. And her humble position and her active attitude and her grateful heart. This is how you stay. But it's the very thing that we don't want to do. See, she recognizes that she's not owed anything Everything that she has is a blessing from God. The fact that she got to glean in the corner of this field and glean after the reapers and get the leftovers to her was enough. She didn't expect anything, any special treatment. She's not praying for it to be easier. God, make my life easier. Nope. She's putting one foot in front of the other and she's going. She's a tough woman. She's an example to all of us, not just women in this room, but to everyone. And in her question, you can, almost, you can almost hear the cadence in her voice. Why have I found favor in your eyes? That you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner. She's in utter shock of what's happening to her. 
In essence, what he's saying is, I see you. I see you, and I know of all that you've done. I know that all you've done. Boaz told her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. How you left your father and your mother and your native land and, and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel. And I love this part. See, this is, this is language of acceptance to a foreign woman, to a Moabite woman who lost everything, who's not from here. You are here under the wings of God where you're taking refuge. See, that was inclusive right there. See, Ruth and Naomi had returned to Bethlehem and now had begun the, the painful reality of what it means to stay. And Boaz clears it all up and blesses her, praying to God for a full reward because she is under his wings. Her refuge is in him. She answers him with gratefulness, not entitlement. See, this is a lesson for all of us. While, while we're doing the hard work, while we're doing the hard work and remaining humble, we also need to be grateful. Hear what I'm saying? While we're staying humble and we're working hard, we need to be grateful. We need to be grateful for what we can see God doing in our lives right now. Remembering that he is ultimately working for his glory and our good. So as the worship team comes up, <coughs> are you having a hard time staying? From all, all these things? <coughs> Are you having a hard time staying? What about your heart? Are you exhibiting a humble heart? Are you walking in humility in your circumstance? Do you recognize that nothing is owed to you? Nothing. Even salvation is not owed to you. What about passivity? Has passivity settled in your heart and your mind and is being projected in your life through actionless living? You're not doing anything. You're not working hard. You're waiting for something, for some miracle to happen. Maybe you think you've worked hard enough. You've worked long enough and hard enough and God owes you. Finally, this should be over already. Or maybe simply you just don't recognize that God is moving in your life even now. In your broken relationships, in your marriage, with your kids, at your workplace, in your neighborhoods. Maybe it didn't all happen or start out the way you wanted it to. Maybe down the road you've hit some bumps that you weren't expecting. Things that just kind of wreck your life. Last week we returned. We returned to God. We said, God, I'm, I'm turning from anger. I'm turning from alcoholism. I'm turning, God, I'm returning to you. I'm bringing it back to you again, God, and I want to stay here. I want to stay in your presence. I want to stay in what you have for me, but it's hard. It's hard because nothing's changing. And I want to give up. Can you recognize the hand of God in your life? Do you see the mercy of God and grace of God in your life? Are you so focused and stuck in your mess that you can't see what God is doing? Because it's easy to get there. So maybe this morning, as the worship team sings this next song, I want to invite you to come to this altar and pray. Come to this altar and fight, do the hard work of staying. 
Maybe you need to come and pray to God and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for a wrong heart and attitude towards my position right now. Forgive me for the way that I've been talking about you as if you're doing nothing, blaming you for my decisions. God, I need the refuge of your wings. God, I need the refuge of your wings. And so, God, I want to stay. I want to do the hard work. I want to stay humble. And I am grateful, God. Help me to stand. Help me to stay. Help me to stay here, but I, I need help in doing so, God. I know that your plan is, is for good, to help me see your hand in my life. That I would respond with a grateful heart to you, oh God, my God. So can we stand? Some of you are here this morning and <coughs> you look at the choices that you've made. The choices that you've made in life and you think, oh man, uh, God, I just really messed up. I don't know if there's a way that I can get out of this or God can deliver me. I love Proverbs 16, 9. It says, the heart of man, the heart of man's plan, oh, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Meaning even in my mess, even when I was doing wrong things, even when Naomi left and didn't trust in the Lord, he was working things out for her good even then. She just didn't see it. And this morning, no matter how far you are, no matter where you're at in your situation, no matter how dark or low you feel, how alone and broken you feel, you are not that far and you are not alone. And God is working out in your story for his glory and your good. So stay, stay and work hard. Be humble and be grateful. So I invite you, even right now, just come to the altar. If you need to pray, you need to pray this prayer. You need to ask God for forgiveness. You need God to give you strength. Don't be shy. Come to the altar and get what you need. Find the shelter of God's wings this morning.